Greetings, my beautiful lovelies. It's Emmy. Welcome back to another episode of Hard Times, where I explore food and recipes from times of hardship. Today, I'm going to do a special Finnish edition because lovely Anna suggested this recipe to me. Not only did she suggest this recipe to me, but she also sent me the ingredients I need to make this recipe. So Anna, thank you so much for both suggesting this recipe and for sending me the necessary ingredients. And today I'm going to be making petulepa. And petulepa, sorry for my terrible finish, is pine bark bread. So this type of bread was made during times of famine and pine bark, actually the inner pine bark, actually called the phloem, was harvested, dried, and ground into a flour and added in combination with wheat as a way to kind of extend the wheat flour. So Anna tells me that other Nordic countries also use pine bark as a way to extend flour, but the Finns actually take great pride in this particular recipe. And she sent me two videos. I used both of those videos as references to create the pine bark bread that I'm going to make today. So one of the videos actually has school children making this at school as a way to remember not only their history but their heritage. So very stinking cute. So the recipe that the school children use is the one that I'm going to be using today. Anna very kindly and very thoroughly translated it from the Finnish to English for me so I could make it today. And on Anna's recommendation I cut it by one sixth. Also I wanted to make sure that I had enough flour had this not come out properly that I could try it again. I also recommend the other video that Anna sent me. I'll put the link to both videos down in the description. And it's of an older fellow actually harvesting the inner bark. And you can see how laborious the process is. He uses a special wooden tool that he's made to scrape and harvest beautiful sheets of the phloem or the inner bark. And then he dries it and then he pulverizes it and then he goes on to make the bread. That video was very useful to me because then I could see the consistency of the dough and I could see how he formed the actual breads. The breads are quite charming. They're round and relatively flat and they have a little hole in the middle of them. So to start this whole process, I need to get my hands on some sourdough starter. That's what's going to give this dough not only flavor, but going to give it a little bit of leavening as well. So I called up my favorite local bakery and around here in Providence, that's Seven Stars Bakery, and I got a little bit of their sourdough starter, which was absolutely wonderful. I was told by the bakery that I needed to use this immediately. Once you have sourdough starter, you need to keep it alive. You take a portion of it away and then you add equal amounts of flour and water. A quarter cup of flour, a quarter cup of water, stir that all together, and then you can keep that in your fridge for about a week before you need to feed it again. You need to keep feeding it and feeding it because what you're doing is growing the sourdough. If you don't give it more flour and reduce the population of goodies in there, then it will die. And yesterday with my leftover sourdough, I made sourdough waffles. I used the King Arthur flour recipe and they were absolutely delicious. So sourdough is just a great thing to have on hand if you can get your little mitts on it. Okay, so I got the sourdough starter. So day one, we needed to create the raski and that is a pre-ferment, kind of similar to a barm or a poolish. It's the sourdough starter along with a little bit of flour and some water and it starts to grow a bit and that's what's going to give you some of that flavor in your bread and some of that you know puffness two and a half teaspoons of my sourdough starter 333 milliliters of warm water at 37 degrees c and i added 250 milliliters of rye flour so anna very kindly sent me this and this is one kilogram of beautiful Finnish rye flour. She said she didn't trust the U.S. rye flour, which I totally agree. She wanted rye that was grown in moonless nights. <laughs> and so this is the real deal. Mix this all really well. You want the sourdough starter to be mixed in really well with the rye. And then I used a napkin and covered that loosely and put it in a warm place. Room temperature is fine for 12 to 14 hours. So day two, we take our starter and then 83 milliliters of rye flour. And now we add 83 milliliters of warm water, same temperature again. And then you'll have a mixture, kind of the consistency of porridge. So then after another 12, 14 hours, we're ready to introduce our petu. And petu is the pine bark flour. She sent me 700 grams of petu yaho. And this is the flour that's made from the inner bark of a pine tree. But it smells lovely. It smells and looks a lot like sawdust. A little bit finer than sawdust actually, but that's what it's reminiscent of. Not surprising though, right? In our first round, we're gonna add 117 milliliters of the petulia, and then we're gonna add 100 milliliters of rye, and then one and a half teaspoons of salt. Mix that really well, and now it's becoming to look more like a dough. Then we're gonna add another 50 milliliters of petu, and then 167 milliliters of rye. 
So then after we combine this all together, we're gonna have a kind of very soft dough. So now we're ready to shape our breads. And based on the video of the older gentleman making petuleba, I saw that he used what looked like white flour to form the dough rings. So I used a little bit of just regular all-purpose flour, flatten it into discs with your hands, and then use some sort of cookie cutter. He actually uses part of a horn where the tip has been cut off and uses that to cut a little hole in the middle. Now you've got your ring of dough and I place this on parchment and you're supposed to let this rise. So I let mine sit for about an hour and a half. Then I bake this in a very hot oven, 225 degrees to 250 degrees C, which translates to about 450 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 to 15 minutes or until the breads are cooked. So after 15 minutes, this is what I have. Aren't they beautiful? I have to say, as they were baking, I could really smell the sourdough. I'm trying to see if I can smell any of the pine. No, it just smells very sour. Almost smells like mustard. You know, mustard the condiment, not mustard the seed, but it almost smells like that. A little bit vinegared. So the very last petulepa I made was a very large one, and from the middle, I made mean, this little tiny one. All right, let's go ahead and taste our pine bark bread. Now, let me open it up for you. And look, it does have a crumb. Remember, there's no yeast, there's no baking soda, there's no baking powder. The only thing that leavened this was the natural little goodies that are inside the sourdough and the CO2 bubbles they create, creates the bubbles inside the bread. Hiva roka halwa. Here we go. Hmm. Mm. Wow. So initially it doesn't taste too bad. That sourdough flavor is very intense and delicious. Nice and sourdoughy, very familiar if you like sourdough bread. And the texture of the bread's pretty good. It's definitely leavened. It's got some air pockets and bubbles and crumb. The crumb is actually quite moist. It is dense. And you do have the flavor of the pine in there. But what's really interesting, at the very kind of end of it, you've got a sourness and a strong bitterness that I imagine comes from the pine bark flour. Mm hmm I wouldn't say it's delicious because it is very sour and very bitter. And the pine flavor is not something I'm used to. It's very resinous, a little bit hoppy, quite strong, but not like I'm having pine needles or even pine needle tea, but it's definitely present. Maybe a little butter will help. Be right back. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That actually makes it taste pretty good. It really balances out that sourness and bitterness of the pine bark flour. With the butter, it's actually quite tasty. I like that. Mm. And I imagine this with a nice thick slab of farmer's cheese on that, it would be delicious. Honestly, for famine food, this is actually pretty good with butter. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is a really fun recipe to make. Yes, it took three days, but it was not that much effort. It was just kind of stretched out over a matter of days. It was fun to watch the raski kind of develop and change and grow and smell. I could smell the sourdough. It was a really, really fun process. So now I've got a jar of sourdough starter growing in my refrigerator. I'm super excited. I'm going to be starting a new series called Fermentation and just starting little recipes all about fermenting. I've made kimchi in the past. Many of you have requested that, so I'm going to do that one. I'm going to do kefir, which is the drink that I'm in love with now, and all kinds of other like cheesy, fermenty kind of fun things to try because it's alive and growing and I'm fascinated by that. Back when I lived in Montana, I did some of these experiments. I made my own ginger brew, I made my own kombucha, I made my own sourdough. So I may revisit some of those recipes if you guys are interested. If you wanna see my kombucha video, it's a really old one. I'll put a link down below and up there in case you're interested. All right, big thanks again to Anna for sending me all of these lovely things. And oh, but she also sent me my favorite Finnish candy bar. It's a podcast. I love these, I love these. She said she sent this to kind of make up for the bad tasting bread, but I actually found it quite good. But I'm gonna taste a podcast. I haven't had one of these in at least a couple years. So super excited for this. If you haven't seen my Emmy Eats Finland videos, I also put those links down below. So the reason why podcast is one of my favorite chocolate bars is because it's chocolate mint. Yay! I don't think I've had a podcast bar this large before. There it is. 
It's made by the company Fatsa. And they also make Zamiyaki, which is probably my least favorite candy, if not thing, ever. Ever. Salty licorice, if you've never had it, it's worth trying just to say you tried it. A lot of people like it. I can't stand it. I find it terrible. I don't understand why people like it, but I know people do, but I am certainly not in that camp. Okay, I can already smell my podcast. It's time to eat. <laughs> oh, it smells so good. Minty, pepperminty, and chocolate. <sighs> Just heavenly. So stinking good. Kind of reminiscent of an Andes mint, that beautiful combination of chocolate and peppermint. That has more of a brittle texture. This is more of a milk chocolate texture, smooth, melt away. Very, very, very smooth consistency. It's almost like European nougat. Good quality milk chocolate, sweet. It's just the perfect balance of chocolate, peppermint, delicious wonderfulness. So that was a really fun way to end a hard times episode with a little bit of good times. Big thanks again to Anna for sending me all of these wonderful things, for suggesting this recipe, for translating the recipe, and just for going to such lengths for me to be able to make this for you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoy that one. I hope you guys learned something. Please share this video with your friends, follow me on social media, subscribe and like this video, and I shall see you in the next one. Toodaloo, take care. Bye! <laughs>